Okay, so we're now going to uh, talk about exponential and logarithmic functions. If you are, uh, if you're looking online, this is going like at our Sakai page. This is going to seem pretty weirdly placed because these are like from chapter seven or something, but. I would describe that as an error on the part of the textbook. I don't think you can leave these derivatives until chapter seven. In particular, the derivative of the exponential function is one of the most important derivatives in calculus. Usually about only half of the students who take count one also take count two. Those students need to know this material now. They can't get put off until chapter seven. So let me just dive into this extremely important derivative. The derivative of e to the x is itself. That is to say, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. e, if you remember from college algebra or wherever, you first saw it is some infinite non-repeating irrational number. I could, well, I don't want to necessarily <coughs> pause class while this calculator loads, but I'll show it to you on the calculator in a moment. And E is more or less specifically defined to have this property. So let me state up front, I'm talking about, or I'm saying the phrase, the derivative of exponential functions, but other exponential functions do not have this property of being their own derivative. For example, the derivative of two to the power of x is not two to the power of x, it's something else. So this is a special property of the natural base E. And because of this property, mathematicians work with E almost exclusively. Um, I suppose I should quantify or qualify that a little, um, like information theorists end up looking at two to the X a lot, but in most fields of mathematics, E to the X is king. And it's king precisely because it's its own derivative and other exponential functions aren't. So let's just look at a few examples. We should do examples involving the chain rule, but let's also take this opportunity to review the product rule. We maybe haven't used that in a while. So f of x is x squared times e to the x. I mean, I don't have a symbol for multiplication on the board, but x squared is a function and e to the x is a function. And these functions are being multiplied together. Then if we want the derivative, 
we take one of the functions, let's say the first function, x squared, and we differentiate it, and we leave the other function alone. Then, now we leave the first function alone, and we're differentiating the second function. It kind of looks like I'm forgetting to take the derivative there, but I'm not. It's just that e to the x is its own derivative. And if you were so inclined, you could pull out an x and an e to the x and be left with a 2 plus x. I think a lot of people would consider that to be a more simplified form of the solution. Or, once again, taking this e to the x as an excuse to review some old derivatives and some old rules, we could look at e to the x divided by something, divided by x squared plus the cosine of x. And if we want the derivative of this, It's plug and play with the quotient rule. The only question is whether we can avoid making any of those little errors that can make calculus so stressful. According to the quotient rule, we should take the derivative of the top function. And again, it kind of looks like I'm just forgetting, but I'm not. e to the x is its own derivative. And the bottom function we should leave alone. And now we should leave e to the x alone and take a derivative of the bottom function. So that's 2x. Remember that the cosine gives you the negative sine. So 2x minus the sine of x. And all, all being divided by this kind of ugly looking thing. And you could, I mean, you could simplify this a little, I suppose, <coughs> or at least you could rewrite it. The question of what's simple and what isn't, does it really have an objective answer? But we have an e to the x, and we have another e to the x, so certainly if we wanted to, we could pull an e to the x out. But, I mean, this is an ugly function, and you can you can try to polish it as much as you want. It's not going to suddenly start being beautiful just because you pull an e to the x out of the numerator. But what I really want to address is the chain rule. So that's fresh in our mind. We did it yesterday. We still need a lot of prep this with that.
uh, e to the two x. Let's start kind of small. If f of x is e to the two x, let's take the derivative. And that's because the chain rule was only yesterday. Let's remind ourselves of it. The chain rule says that if you have a composition, if you have one function stuck inside of another function, and you want to take the derivative of that, well, you take the derivative of the outside function, you stick the inside function inside of it, and then you get another term from that inside function. You get the derivative of the inside function, and these are all being multiplied together. Students don't always find it obvious when you have something written like this. First of all, that composition is going on. Second of all, what the outside and the inside functions are. There's another alternative piece of notation that maybe makes it clearer. You see this, for example, a lot in programming, where people don't want to write e caret something. But the exponential function is sometimes written like the trig functions as a three-letter abbreviation with something then inside the argument. And if you write it like this, I think that probably makes it a lot clearer that we have composition going on, that one function is stuck inside of another function, and in particular, that the exponential function is outside. Again, very literal. The exponential function is literally outside of the parentheses and the 2x is the inside function. Again, very literal, it's inside the parentheses. And if we then want the derivative of this, well, the exponential function e to the x is its own derivative. The inside function, 2x, gets stuck inside of it. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So the derivative of 2 times x is 2. And aside from the fact that it would be more normal to write the constant out front, that is the answer. Um, This alternative notation, I think, makes the chain rule easier, but
but it's not the notation that you usually see in your calculus textbook. So, we should try to acclimate to this notation, f of x equals e to the 2x, and we should be able to recognize that if we have an expression like this, then whatever we have up here is the inside function. And we don't have any parentheses this time, but this is still very literal. It's inside the exponent. And the exponential is the outside function. So just repeating work we've already done, but with our function written in a slightly different way, the derivative of the exponential is the exponential. The inside function gets stuck inside of it. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inside function. And of course, however we write the exponential, we end up with the same answer. This and this are the same function, just written a little differently. So let's uh, let's look at a slightly more intricate example. I will, sorry, a uh, frog in my throat. I will say, um, I'll try to find time later in the course to sort of explain to you why this is such a desirable property, why we care that e to the x is its own derivative. I would say that nine out of 10 applications of this derivative look exactly like this, e raised to some constant times x. Just like we gave you those kind of messy quotient rule problems, and then all the quotient word problems we've done have been a lot cleaner. Something like this is a pretty artificial function, but it's designed to give us practice with the chain rule and to review the trigonometric derivatives, and also to review what happens if we have a constant out there. To take these, those questions in reverse order, the constant is just going to sit there when we take the derivative. Let's use a different color, that constant three. If we take the derivative of this, is just going to sit there. And then you need to recognize that you have an, have a composition with that exponential on the outside and the sign on the inside. So the derivative of the exponential is the exponential. 
We don't take any derivative here. We just stick the inside function inside. And then we need to multiply by the derivative of the inside function. And again, I feel like it's kind of normal in this situation to rewrite things a little, but it's not, uh, not the biggest deal. It's barely even the smallest deal. I think mathematicians prefer having the exponentials written last so that there's not this big gap between the functions. It's just a completely stylistic thing. So what about other exponential functions? I've made the statement that E is special. E to the X is its own derivative none of the other exponential functions are. Two to the x isn't, one half to the x isn't, nothing but e to the x is its own derivative. I've also said that e to the x is by far the most important exponential but it's probably worth at least addressing the question. What if you have an exponential other than E? What if you have, for example, a two to the power of X? And I'll just answer this question first, and then I'll talk about where the answer comes from. If you have an exponential function with a base other than e, it's almost its own derivative. There's an a to the x here, but there's a number written in the front. And that number, let me give myself more room to work so I'm not all cramped in. The number in front in this derivative is the natural logarithm of the base. The natural logarithm of A. And where on earth is this natural logarithm coming from? This natural logarithm is coming from the fact that any exponential can be rewritten to have e in the base. Two to the x is e raised to the power of the natural logarithm of two times x. You may or may not have learned that trick in college algebra or high school algebra or some other algebra course. And if you then take the derivative of this, it's the chain rule. e to the x is its own derivative. So we take the derivative of e to the x, we stick the inside function inside of it. Then we multiply by the derivative of the inside function. And don't be confused here. Don't let yourself 
be intimidated. The natural logarithm of two is just some number. The natural logarithm of two is 0 0.6931 something. So when you're taking the derivative of the inside function, this is a constant times x, and the derivative is just that constant. Now, going back to the observation that 2 to the power of x is e to the natural logarithm of 2 times x, we can now go in the other direction. What we have out front is 2 to the x. So, we get 2 to the x times the natural logarithm of 2. And aside from the fact that the natural logarithm is written at the back instead of at the front, this is precisely what I would have gotten if I just plugged and played with this formula h prime of x is, according to this formula, the natural log of 2 times 2 to the power of x. So, exactly what I got down there. So, I mean, this form to the with bases other than E is not going to show up super often in this class. But for example, a lot of science classes like using 10 to the X instead of E to the X. And in one of those classes, if you're doing calculus, it would be important to be able to take to say that the derivative of 10 to the x is the natural logarithm of 10 times 10 to the x. Or if you take an online like programming class, lots of two to the x's in programming because stuff in programming is done in binary. And you would want to be able to take that derivative. The derivative of 2 to the x is the natural log of 2 times 2 to the x. Almost their own derivatives, but with constants in front. Any question about the derivatives of the exponential function? I mean, it will be easier to know whether there are questions once you've tried the quizzes, and then you can ask me if you have questions. But let's give a second derivative. So, two derivatives in one day. Of course, still not as bad as the day we did trigonometry and shoved six derivatives on you. The natural logarithm. We should be able to take this derivative. It's actually a really important one. 
and I'll just write what it is. The derivative of the natural logarithm, this is maybe one of, this is one of very few functions that becomes nicer when you take its derivative. The derivative of the natural logarithm of x is 1 divided by x. So the logarithm turns into a very nice algebraic expression when you take its derivative. And having said that, I guess we ought to do some examples. Let's, again, I don't want us to forget about the product rule or the quotient rule just because we've moved on to other things for now. So that's that f of x be x times the natural logarithm of x. And let's differentiate this thing. We've got one function times another. So this is going to be a product rule situation. To take the derivative, we um, take the derivative of the first function, the derivative of x is 1. The second function we leave alone. Then we leave the first function alone and take the derivative of the natural logarithm. And I've sort of said this before, I'm not a fiend for trying to simplify answers. I think a lot of that is really pretty artificial. I think what a textbook will say is simplified might not really be much simpler than um, the unsimplified answer. But at the very least, if I have x times the 1 divided by x, those x's cancel. And we wind up with the natural logarithm of x plus 1. What about the chain rule? I, don't, I think that probably using the chain rule with the natural logarithm is easier or at least more natural for students than with the exponential functions because we get put back in this very literal situation where we have literally a function that's outside the parentheses and we have a function that's inside the parentheses and those are the outside and inside functions of the chain rule. So to take the derivative, we take the derivative of the outside function, we take the derivative of the natural logarithm, 
and that inside function gets stuck inside of it. And then we multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So I would probably at least go so far as to write to this as a single fraction. The textbooks sometimes present this as something for students to memorize. Um, that the derivative of the natural logarithm of a function is the derivative of the function divided by the function. I don't know that you need to memorize that particularly. You'll get this using the chain rule, and once you've done enough problems, you'll sort of internalize this naturally. But this is what we got back on this frame. The derivative of x squared plus x plus 1 divided by x squared plus x plus 1. Let's, um, let's talk about the implications of this derivative a bit. We have some time. Let's go to desmos.com. Online students aren't seeing anything at the moment, but I'll share the screen when I get there. And let's remind ourselves what the natural logarithm looks like. And in particular, let's remind ourselves how incredibly slow growing the natural logarithm is. Let's let y go up to 10. Let's let x go up to a hundred, maybe some. So when x is a hundred, the natural logarithm is still stuck below 10. Let's that x get bigger. Let's that x go up to a thousand. Well, the natural logarithm still stuck below 10. So some people, sometimes like on podcasts and stuff, hear people talk about stuff growing logarithmically, seemingly in the belief that they're saying that thing is growing fast. It's the opposite of that. Logarithmic growth is incredibly slow. By about 150,000, the logarithm is still languishing at 14 point something. Why does the logarithm grow so slowly? We now see a calculus answer to that, which is that the derivative of the logarithm is 1 divided by x. 
So as x gets bigger and bigger, the logarithm is growing slower and slower. When x is 100, is, oh, I radically underestimated that number, not uh, 150,000. When x is 1,504,000, that means that the function is growing at a rate of about 1 divided by 1,504,000. So the reason the logarithm sees this incredibly slow growth is that its rate of change is getting very, very close to zero as x gets big. So the bigger it gets, the slower it grows. Now the absolute opposite of that would be the exponential function. When people say logarithmic growth and they're trying to say that something is growing quickly, the word they are actually looking for is exponential growth. This is extremely fast. When x is sitting at about 11.6, the exponential function is sitting at about 116,000. Why does the exponential function grow so fast? Well, we can now approach that question from a point, how to this point of view, by remembering that the exponential function is its own rate of change. So when x is 11.661, the exponential function is about 116,000, and it's growing at a rate of 116,000. So the exponential is the opposite of the logarithm. For the logarithm, when x gets big, it causes the rate of change to get small. For the exponential function, when x gets big, it causes the rate of change to get big. The sort of easy way of stating this would be that the exponential function is accelerating, whereas the logarithmic function is decelerating. We'll talk about this property, about the idea that some functions accelerate and some functions decelerate fairly shortly now, we're almost to the end of this chapter, but that will be after our midterm break, I would think.